Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to From Campus to Corporate. I'm your host, Jacoby Aguilar, and today I am joined by Justin, Justin. Morris. Yeah, absolutely. Howdy. Welcome, Justin. How are you feeling today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Excited to, to be here and to have this uh, conversation with you. Hey, and I'm excited to have you here as well. Um, for those of you joining in with us, Justin Morris is a financial analyst with Chevron. Ooh, big name, right? Big name. Um, so you got your degree here from the University of Houston downtown. When when was that exactly? Yeah, so first off, thank you for, for having me excited to be back on campus and having this conversation and being a part of this uh, tremendous series. So yeah, for me, so I graduated from the University of Houston downtown in, in 2017. So it's been about six years almost, I want to say, and I, the campus has changed tremendously. So it's nice to see it growing and, and everything. But yeah, so that was that's me. And your concentration for your degree was? Accounting, yeah. So accounting accounting, accounting and finance minor. Um, so yeah, I, I took a couple classes here and there. I actually came um, for about two years of school. I did undergraduate, uh, my associates at community college and transferred over to UHD for, for a few years. Okay. Well, that's awesome because I know that I think still about 50% of UHD students, at least here at the College of Business, they're transfer students. Mm -hmm. So they come in either having some credits from, you know, junior college or their full associates, and then they continue on and finish their undergraduate degree. So you say that your undergraduate degree was in accounting specifically. However, the role reads as financial analyst. What made that change from, mm, I'm going to go more into finance over accounting? So that's a good question. So it wasn't so much as a, a change for me as it was the industry I was getting into. So at Chevron, they kind of look at accounting and finance as going hand in hand. So the role that I accepted for an accounting or financial analyst, you could either have an accounting degree or a finance degree. Um, and then typically kind of when you come in, you may start like more accounting, transactional type of work. And then as you kind of progress over a few years and you get into more of the financial analysis and different things of that nature. So I wouldn't say it was something I specifically did. It was just more so the role that I kind of came into. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. I've definitely seen those postings where it's like accounting or finance, but okay, absolutely. So that said, either way, right, whether you, you have the accounting degree or the finance degree, right, um, what inspired you to kind of move into accounting and finance as like a profession? What, what sparked that interest? So for me, um, I always had an interest in, in business as I was younger and kind of growing up wanting to just do different things and learn how money worked, right? Um, so it was actually by coincidence, I want to say in high school, that I had an elective class that I kind of just got thrown into an accounting class. Uh, and looking back at it now, it was probably a blessing in disguise because I really didn't know what I wanted to major in. And so being in that class and getting like a firsthand exposure to what accounting was, um, and then I did really well at it. I, I got an A in the class, really enjoyed understanding how kind of money moved around and just the different concepts of accounting. So I said, hey, what the heck, I'll, I'll major in this. I, I think it's pretty, pretty cool and I, I understand it. So it'll probably be a piece of cake. And then, you know, you get into your first year and you realize that, hey, I don't know anything and it's uh, you only saw the tip of the iceberg in a, in a semester of a high school class. And so I got the whole feeling of, oh, man, what did I get myself into? But, you know, that's one thing I will say about accounting is that even over the years, like the concepts just kind of build on each other and it doesn't really change. And so that's why I decided to kind of stick it out and be like, hey, I can I can get this. And it's just because the fact that even though it got harder, as long as you kind of leaned on the, the main principles, everything kind of stayed the same. Okay, got it. Um, well, there's another question that I wanted to ask you, but you actually bring something up in my mind because mm -hmm. I've had students come in to ask me this question, and I figure there may be no one better to answer this question than someone that works in the field. If you could, could you describe for me the difference between accounting and finance? Just mm -hmm. like kind of like either as a major or as a profession, because students will come in and they'll say, oh, well, I, I think I want to do finance or accounting, but I don't know you know, the difference between the two, what I'd be doing um, and or like how they are different because they're typically, you know, grouped together. Well, I'll give a I'll give a shot at it, but I don't know if there's a perfect answer that would go to that. I think it more so would depend on your career field that you're going into. And so when I think about accounting in terms of whether it's Chevron or just the energy industry, 
Um, a lot of times when I think about accounting, you're thinking about transactional items, you know, journal entries, uh, movements, and working with the financial statements of understanding, you know, certain balance sheet accounts or whether it's income statement, you're understanding the impact of things and how they move. And sometimes when you get into the, the finance side, you're talking about more so of the um, telling the story of like understanding variance analysis and different things that, that go on. And so for me, or how it typically would work at, at Chevron specifically in your accounting roles, again, it's gonna be more so of your transactional basis knowledge, putting um, information into systems, making sure it ties out correctly. Um, and then on the finance side, you might be interpreting those results that you see from the accounting transactions and then being able to tell the story or look at the um, month over month or year to date changes and then trying to shape that into your analysis and then communicate that message up to different leaders who can make decisions off of it. But in terms of chatting with students, I, I always think the best answer is to just have them, like you mentioned, like reach out and network with folks so they can get a better understanding of what the job is because what a accounting or finance role could be in Chevron might be different in a public accounting firm or in the healthcare industry or, or et cetera, like for whatever industry you want to apply. So, but that's, that's kind of what I've seen. Okay. Got it. Thank you for that. Like really well kind of rounded answer that gave like context dependent upon like the situation where you are, what you're doing. Um, I think it is important to remember that context does matter mm -hmm. and especially the position that they want to go into matters a lot too. Um, that ultimate, that for a lot of students that will ultimately kind of determine mm -hmm. which major am I going to go into. But it's good to know that with the accounting degree you got, you still, in, you know, went into a financial <clears throat> analyst role. So students can also be aware of the fact that even once you get your degree, everything isn't quote unquote set in stone, you know? Yeah. Um, and just a caveat yeah, to, to add on to that was just something I thought about is sometimes the um, degrees kind of go hand in hand too, right? So me having an accounting degree and coming into Chevron and doing an accounting supporting role um, help build my foundational knowledge and understanding of not just what goes on in accounting in an energy company like Chevron, but then it allowed me now to where I may not be as heavily involved in accounting work and it may more so be finance, but I still lean on the accounting principles and understanding of what should be going on and what should I be expecting. So if I don't see something that doesn't add up or doesn't make sense, I can lean on those principles that I'm aware of and use that to understand like, hey, is what I'm looking at, is it really right? Or do I need to dig into something a little bit deeper? And the same can be said from a finance background. So if you're a finance major and you understand what certain ratios or things that you're looking at should should appear to be, and you notice that accounting transactions may look a different way, you can always say, hey, this is my perspective and this is what I see. So I think it goes hand in hand. So a lot of roles can be interchangeable uh, and students just sort of feel like they're like kind of pigeonholing themselves if they yeah. do one or the other. I, I agree. Uh I say this sometimes, couldn't have paid for a better answer. Um, it, all of that context, it really does matter. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy that they're going to be hearing it from someone that's literally lived the experience and can attest to it. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, I do want to, I do wonder, since you mentioned initially you kind of, in high school is where you had that introduction to accounting. Mm -hmm. And then, but again, similar, I think, to a lot of people's experience, they get the, you know, like what is it, financial accounting first. And then they're like, oh, this is fun. This is this is interesting. I feel I find this really satisfying. But then you kind of get hit by everything else when it comes to accounting. How do you feel that your university experience prepared you for the roles that you've entered into since then? I think a big part of any career that you go into or any project or anything you take on, um, you're always going to have like adversity or challenges when you come into a role or start somewhere. And there's always that feeling of, you know, you hit the brick wall where it's you like, hey, I, I think I know what I'm doing. But then you get into the actual real world and you're like, wow, this is more than what I thought it was. And so I think part of what school prepares you for and throwing so much information at you semester after semester is just that you realize that you may struggle at first. But then as you keep going, the idea is that the concept catches on and you're able to apply it after that. And I don't think it's any different when you get into a career or a job 
you know, right? Like in, in Chevron, I've, I've been there maybe six years and I've had seven different roles. And I was even a part of a two year program where you're moving every six months. So you're getting put in positions where you're being thrown into a team where you don't know anything about and you're given six months to get up to speed, learn what you're doing, try to contribute, and then you have to teach it to somebody else before you move on somewhere else. Wow. And I think it's the same concept. At first, you have this feeling like, hey, I can conquer anything. And then you get in and you're hit with this, man, I don't know anything. And it's very humbling at first. But I would say I think that's part of what school kind of teaches you is that you have to go through the adversity and stick with it, right? from year one to year two, all the way up until you get your degree and kind of graduate. So I would say that's kind of uh, how I would connect the two. Got it. So it sounds like school gave you a combination, well, university gave you a combination of like learning to deal with it, stick through, you know, uh, the whole process, right? Yeah. Um, being, and what is it, being consistent mm -hmm. too, right? Like that's mm -hmm. a big thing. A lot of something that we say in the career center a lot is that like half of that was showing up. Yes. Um, show up, do what you're supposed to do. Nine times out of ten, it's going to work out the way it should. Um, and so it's good to hear that you kind of got that kind of a, I would say, like discipline, right? Yeah. And then further, you did get a lot of that foundational principal information, but a lot of that stuff you can't learn until you're physically there. Mm -hmm. You're in the fray. It sounds like you were doing like a bit of a rotational program. Is that it? Like every few months you were with different like projects or teams? Yeah. So Chevron has um, kind of like this early career development program and it's intended for folks who can come in through internships. Uh, they do campus hiring or in my case, they have internal candidates where you work there for a few years and then you demonstrate kind of high performance and then you're selected to be a part of the program. And what this is designed to do is to get you some early career experience because like we were just mentioning that a lot of students or people in general early in their career, they don't really have an idea of, hey, what do I enjoy doing, what do I not enjoy doing? And so what this program is designed to do is it's designed to get you four different experiences within your first two years of work or so um, to just put you in different teams and different areas of the business, whether you like something that's like a project role where you're the work is undefined and you're working in ambiguity and you just have to kind of figure things out or you can have roles that are more structured where you show up and you know what you're going to do every day. Um, there's some that are in kind of our upstream areas of the business, downstream areas, some where you could be doing corporate reporting. You could work with non-finance folks, people who are engineers, audit, tax. So it's all over the board and the idea is just that you have a manager who has a career development plan who sits down with you and asks like, hey, what type of experiences do you want to get? And so you get to kind of shape out what you want that to kind of look like. Um, and so I, I really enjoyed it. I feel like it was challenging. I had some really good experiences. There's also opportunities to to travel. I didn't get that chance because I was a part of the COVID class. So we um, had to do a lot of our stuff remotely. Yeah. But now that things are opening back up, you have people going to various um, countries across the, the world because we're an international company. So, you know, whether it's Australia, Argentina, Nigeria, Canada. So there's a way to get some different experiences while also taking in different cultures and stuff like that, too, that I think the program is really great for. I, you know, at some point throughout this, I do usually ask, is there anything that you want to, like, you know, promote on behalf of, you know, the company that you're working with? But just talking about it, that I feel like that's such a big pull. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be fair, it's Chevron, right? Yeah. So if anyone hears that name and they're like, oh, wow, and energy, industry, mm -hmm. whoa. Mm -hmm. um, and just the sound of that program, grip, just amazing, amazing. Um, I will, will say, I'm a little curious. So now that you've had all of those experiences, I mean, you've been able to touch here, there, a little bit of information from just about everywhere. You're in the role that you're in now. Do you enjoy it? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, actually, coincidentally, the role that I'm in now is uh, the same group that I did one of my rotations on the program when I first started. So I've kind of come full circle um, after two years. It's a it's a different team that I'm working with, but same group. So I, I enjoyed it that much. That I was like, hey, I want to come back and, and do it again. So, yeah, I mean, I, I love the people that I work with. I, I would say that's another big thing that I it's important when you when you choose your career is the culture. Um, and that's just because you want to make sure that you're set up for success. Right? The, the work is going to be the work. So you're not going to enjoy it all the time. There's going to be days that you show up and you like it. And there's going to be days that you show up and you don't like it. But like you said, showing up is, is kind of half the battle. So um, when you work on a team with people that you really enjoy working with and you get along with, it just makes it a little bit more 
bearable. And so I am very fortunate to have worked on some really great teams with some really great people. Um, so yeah, hands down, I, I love the the job that I'm in now. I'm getting some broad exposure to to a lot of different things. But again, I'm you know I've only been in this role for about six months, so I feel like I'm hitting that. Okay, I know what I'm doing. I know I know what our objectives are, and so now I finally feel like I'm like kind of hitting my stride. All right, excellent. Uh, for the students that are interested in like say a financial analyst role, would you mind walking us through kind of like a day of what it is that you do? It's going to be a fun question too because I, I think as a lot of people you'll get the cliche answer that there's no two days are the same or you might do different stuff but i think for me my day usually always starts with i try to set some time aside for for reading um whether it's like a book i'm doing or i read the news or check out different articles just to kind of keep myself abreast of kind of what's going on not just within the industry but also financially just other relevant news that's going on. Yeah. Um, so I try to set aside 30 minutes when I first kind of get in and have my breakfast to just read um, or watch some videos of the news while I'm doing that. Um, after I get done with that, I'll probably check emails for a little while, see if there's things that I've missed or kind of iron out my day on kind of what needs to be done. And then you may have various meetings that you're checking in with teams or different projects that you're giving updates on. Um, and then again, I've had roles where I've been in financial closes where you have certain days that, hey, on this day, you need to do your commentary for your earnings or your cash flow, your OPEX, or maybe other days you have to give presentations on your results. So I think it, it just varies on the roles, but I would say a, a typical day is kind of a mixture of, of all those things, you know, reading, personal time, meetings, um, and then setting some time aside for your, whether you're working on a project um, a new learning, trying to build a skill set or something like that. So it's really a, a puzzle of things that kind of just go together every day. Okay. Um, sounds very kind of uh, multifaceted, mm -hmm. I guess is the best way that I could put it. Um, I'm really curious as to know like your opinion about what are, what do you feel are like maybe the top three soft skills that you use in your day to day? Number one, I would say is probably communication. Um, and I think communication is an important tool to have with people. And that's something I always try to give advice when I'm talking to students or other people at recruiting conferences or just various different ways that I interact. Um, and that's because, you know, the work or your, your technical skills or your degree information from academics you'll learn on, on campus at school or you know, they'll teach you what you need to know once you get into your, your job, but being able to have communication with your coworkers and teammates around you is very key because one, when you're coming to a role and you don't know a lot, you need to be able to feel comfortable asking questions. So it's important to feel like you're empowered to speak up, or if you don't understand something, don't be afraid to like raise your hand and ask like, hey, I didn't understand what you just went over. Like, can you give it to me again, right? Just so you can really understand, right? Because at the end of the day, the worst thing you can do is somebody can ask you if you understand and you say, yeah, and you really don't. And then you turn in something that's, you know, it's not good or not what people are expecting. That's not going to reflect well on you. So communication um, is very important. And also because you're going to handle not every interaction with folks are going to be positive or right. So you need to be able to handle conflict and having good communication skills can help you kind of iron those situations out. Um, another soft skill that I would say is important to have is being able to persuade people. Um, and sometimes that works, especially when you're in team environments where people are going to have different perspectives. So the ability to hear what other people are saying and then maybe get your point across and use a little bit of persuasion as to maybe why your idea might be a better solution than somebody else's is always good. And not to say you're always going to be right. Like maybe you're going to persuade somebody to go with your idea instead of mine, but it's still a, a good skill to have that I think people could work on. And then lastly, I would just say being able to be self-aware, uh, I think is a big one as well. Um, and the reason I say that is just, you have to, in order to progress and develop yourself, you need to be able to understand where you're at. And sometimes, you know, people, it's easy for us to look at others and be like, oh, I know what they do well and I know what they don't do well. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's it's hard for us to point the fingers back at ourselves and be like, hey, I know this is what I do well. And this is what I don't do well. And 
So normally we'll only focus on the things that we do well. And, or maybe I feel like I do something well and you see it and you're like, hey, I don't think you do that as well. So I think the ability to be self-aware and understand what you're good at and maybe when people tell you something that you're not as good at, being able to take that in without being defensive, especially when you're new and you're receiving a lot of feedback, right? Because people are trying to get you acclimated to your job. And so I would say those are my top three that I think are really important. Got it. Okay. Uh, if I got that right, that is communication, a level of a certain level of persuasion in terms of like getting ideas across. And um, that last one was drawing blank. Self awareness. <laughs> self awareness. Yeah, self -awareness. For folks that, uh, and that is a part of self awareness is also being open to constructive criticism as well as like taking feedback, especially early on in the role. Yeah. Um, sometimes, right, um, when we're working hard, we're just doing our best. Um, what are some ways in which we might be able to uh, see where we are if we can't see it in ourselves? I think that falls kind of on the, the last four category that we talked about, and I think it would be getting feedback. And that's something that's really big um, where I work as well, too, is you want to have constant dialogue and communication, not just with your manager or your supervisor, but even sometimes just with your teammates. And you want to understand like, hey, this is maybe I perceive myself or I think I'm doing this type of a job. What do you think? You know, right. And I think that's the best way to understand a really level set where you're at is to get what you think they would call 360 feedback. So you want three feedback from all around you, not just people above you, but you want it from your peers or maybe you're in a position where you're leading a team. You might want to get feedback from the people that are on your team. And I think, you know, everybody may have different things to say, but you'll find a couple of things that people have in common that they may say about you that you don't always know about yourself. So I think that would be the most important thing if you're just not sure where you're at is just ask somebody else, whether it's a friend, coworker, you know, a family member, a boss. It could be really anybody can give you feedback. Um, but the idea is just to be very specific about what you're asking. So if there's something you're not certain about, like, hey, um, I'm not really great with my communication skills. I have this presentation coming up. You know, can you give me some feedback on, on how you think I'm doing? And just getting those steps and maybe somebody tells you, like, hey, I, I, you, you talk too fast. You need to slow down a little bit. Or, you know, I notice that you tend to move around a lot. OK, well, maybe I need to be a little bit more still. Same thing, like, you know, when you're doing reports, right? It's like, hey, maybe I go into too much detail. Like, maybe you can summarize it up a little bit. So I think just asking people. Um, and, and the great thing is, even if it's constructive, I wouldn't call it criticism. I would still call it feedback because sometimes you can give people feedback that's positive, like, hey, you're doing a great job. I really like the way you do this. But you could also say, hey, I, I think you're doing a good job. But if you wanted to get better, I think here's a couple of suggestions on how you can improve. And I would still say that that's that's feedback. It doesn't because constructive criticism always has like a negative mm -hmm. connotation to it. So I, I think as long as you look at it as feedback and just assume positive intent, I think then that you'll be able to, to handle it a bit better. Got it. I'm happy that you covered feedback. Um, I did want people to hear about that because I think that um, being proactive when it comes to feedback is so important. Um, we, even though, yes, we can all do our best with the knowledge that we have, that something that we say a lot, again, in the career center is that people can't know what they don't know. And especially if you're entering into a new field, new office, new job entirely, um, there's no way to know how well you are doing or how well you could do if you made some improvements without you know, speaking to the folks that have already been there, that kind of know their way around. Um, and if you don't mind, follow up to the original question from soft skills. I want to kind of go to the technical side. What like do you feel is the are there specific software that you use or any like, you know, common like uh, uh, applications that we all know about that we might want to practice if we're thinking about becoming financial analyst? I think the the top ones that, that come to mind and all kind of separated into two categories. There's a couple that I think you could still do internally yourself to, to be sharp. And then there's a couple technical, whether you want to call them digital tools or applications or things you can look at. Um, from that portion of like tools or different softwares, I think um, in accounting and finance, you work a lot with um, Excel. So being able to, and whether that's just Excel, but just data in, in general is probably a better way to phrase it. But um, understanding tools on how you can look at big data sets and understand how to like manipulate them 
or find ways to input formulas or different things like that so that you can pull out the story or information that you want to get from that. So whether that's a, you know, like a pivot table, advanced formulas, um, whether you want to write coding, different things of that nature, just being able to understand how to work with data um, is very key for a lot of finance jobs, whether it's a certain industry, right? You're always going to have to tell the story of something or kind of vice versa if you're in a, let's say, public accounting job, right? And you're creating financial statements for your clients or looking into certain things, you need to be able to navigate them and, and understand how it works. So I'd say that's basic and, and fundamental. And then now you get into the new kind of digital era push where now you're looking at different coding softwares like Python, Tableau, different things like that, Power BI, where you're using data to create visuals, like to share with people where you're seeing things in real time. So I think any um, experience that you have in any of the information systems or, you know, I know SAP is a, a big one that people use, but depending where you work, your platforms are going to be a little bit different. So I wouldn't say there's really a way that you can prepare to, to kind of use that. It's going to be job specific, um, but really any tools that can show how you can look at a process and maybe make it more efficient or maybe streamline it a little bit is always a plus. So, and I know that can also be considered like a mentality. So maybe like just questioning things and that's a good segue um, into the other portion of it, which is I think some skills that, that people is really good to have is critical thinking skills, right? So a lot of jobs are looking for people who are like problem solvers. So again, as part of that asking questions when you get in, but understanding kind of what's going on. So something that, you know, a mentor has always told me is like, to really make sure you understand something is you should always go five whys deep on something. Mm -hmm. So if somebody tells you something and you say why, and they can explain it and they say, well, why is that? And the idea is you go five levels down. And if you can go five levels down, then you probably really understand what's going on. And if you can't go that far down, then maybe it's like, okay, I need to dig into this a little bit more. So I think critical, critical thinking is, is a big one. Um, outside of that, I would say, really just skills that you can build on, right, is just understanding the impact of things. So just being able to process and think through things. How does How is something that happens outside of my job going to impact what happens inside of my job, right? And, and that has to do with whether it's something that's like geopolitics, right, especially working in the energy industry. It's like, how does something that happens halfway across the globe in Russia or Ukraine, how is that going to impact us here in the United States? We know that there's an impact, right? You just have to kind of find out what it is. And that's a very high level example. But I think just being able to connect the dots, also being a, somebody who can, who's a fast learner um, and flexible, right? So it takes a, um, I guess a good way to cap that together with say maybe a, like a growth mindset. So not somebody that comes in with a fixed mindset to say, hey, this is my job. This is only what I'm going to do. But having the mindset like, okay, I know this is my job, but how can I learn and expand this to do other things that might impact me? And I think that just realizing that, you know, your career, even after you graduate, your career is not the end of your learning journey, right? You're always going to be learning. So I think that's a big thing we talk about in Chevron too, is just having a growth mindset and being able to continuously grow your capabilities and learn new um, skills as you progress. Yeah. Um, what is it? Something that I tell students all the time is that whenever they're going to be going into their industry of choice, right? Something that they should be prepared for is to be kind of a forever learner, right? Um, industries change, things move. Uh, what is it? The technology that we use that switches around. This yeah. upcoming like AI stuff yep. has kind of been on everyone's mind, like uh, especially as it pertains to like analyst roles. For, not quite sure where those connections truly exist, but I'm sure you have a little bit more insight on it. Um, but I will ask this. Um, so we've covered both the soft skills as well as some of those technical skills. So technical skills, including Excel, um, data visualization tools, um, software that allows you to control, manipulate, you know, data, because that's really important. Um, so how do you stay kind of like up to date on, you know, new technologies and things as they, um, as they grow and persist, does Chevron have a program for it? Are there like courses that you can take, or have have things mostly been the same and you've been able to use the same software? Good question too. So I would say it's a combination of 
internal learning inside of your job and then there's the external portion of it as well so yes chevron does have a lot of tools and resources that you can learn new skills um so they do offer like kind of online training courses where we have like digital teams that are focused on those new technologies and things that you can implement whether it's from it perspective or uh, digital awareness right if you want to learn how to code how to use ai different things of that nature they there's a plethora of different resources internally that you can watch videos of buy learnings but then there's also teams that you can kind of sit down with so maybe you don't understand the technical skills that it takes to implement the changes yourself but maybe you have an idea hey i have this process in place i don't exactly know how to change it but i think that there's a better way to do it and this is what i'm thinking then you can sit down with somebody that has the technical skills to build what you want. They just need you to walk them through the inputs, what the systems are like so that they can build it for you. So I think there's a good partnership um, because a lot of times people get intimidated when they think about digital tools. And I, myself, I, I can attest to this. It's just sometimes you're like, hey, I don't know how to code or maybe this software you have to be able to write in a certain language or something that you don't really understand. And that can be intimidating sometimes. So not feeling like you have to like take it all on yourself is sometimes a relief. And so there's also that avenue, but then there's also, and then there's also trainings, right? So you can um, ask your supervisor, your manager, like if there's a certain course that you want to pay to go to, like maybe, Hey, like there's this dashboard in a day, or there's this coding class that I want to take online. And it's, maybe two weeks and it's two or $300 and I'm going to learn this skill set. And I think as long as you can demonstrate the value and how you're going to use it in your job, then Chevron will fully support you. So you have that avenue as well. But then outside of that, there's also resources. And I've had to do this sometimes where maybe I'm building out a report or a dashboard for something. And I don't fully understand how it is. I'll, I'll go to the internet and I'll go to YouTube and I'll, watch videos in my spare time to understand right and i think that's the best way to kind of solve problems is that you have to actually kind of roll your sleeves up and dig into things a little bit so again i think it's a combination of different things you can do inside of your job but then outside of your job as well got it wow i didn't well i was unaware that sharon like provided so many like resources for mm -hmm. you in terms of like oh there's there's something you want to learn sure go for it absolutely um even if that's kind of like like your own personal growth, your own, your own personal learning, if it can contribute in one way or another, um, perhaps then yeah, go for it. That support means a lot. And it means a lot to be with a company that kind of pours into you. They want to see you succeed just like, uh, just like you want to see them succeed. That's why you're there. Right. Yeah. Um, but then also I think it is important just to, again, uh, sh uh, echo what you said, yeah. being able to solve problems on your own, sometimes crack open YouTube or like, you know, mm -hmm. some kind of course or something. Um, that's also super important. Question. Okay. <laughs> I, I can't help but phrase it in that way. Um, so what would you, what would be your advice to students that are currently looking to do what you do? Right now, there's so many different courses that exist, right? In terms of like learning how to um, be fluent in data and learning how to, you know, be a, be a data analyst or like be a data engineer or scientist or this, that, whatever. Um, if someone is right now going to university, what are some things that they can do to like put themselves in a position to be kind of like where you are now? Um, so I would say I, I would take a step back and say that it's important to learn your, your technical skills, right? So you have those things that you're going to learn in school when you have various projects. Um, so I would say there's the people aspect um there's the self aspect and then maybe there's the the worker project aspect the worker project aspect is important and that's where you're going to learn to use excel to do the coding to do all the technical skills about working with data and to build your skill set of things that you can show like hey this is what i learned how to do but then there's the the self portion of it which is just okay why is it important that i need to know how to do this and what uh how is this going to better my career, my personal and professional development. But then I think a portion of it that really goes unnoticed that I, I want to hit on that's very important is the people aspect. And that's because when you want to get into a, an organization or a company anywhere, right, if you're recruiting, 
you have to be able to communicate and have conversations with people. And I think that's more so the part that kind of goes unnoticed because I've I've ran into a lot of people that have the technical skills, they have the experience, but when it comes to being able to represent themselves and tell me the value that they've created or the impact of their work, it's hard for them to have a, a thorough conversation. So not to say that that's the end all be all, but there's a portion of it to be said that, you know, you need to be able to have communication, to be able to have just a conversation with people. Um, because again, we, I think we're getting away from that. Hey, I'm just going to show up and do my work by myself. And that's it. We're getting into more of that collaboration and realizing that we have to work with other people. And so I think having those skills are really what would set you apart or help you stand out. And that's the question people always ask, how do I stand out? I think the first thing you have to think about is when you have a conversation with somebody, having the eye contact, catching their attention, right? I always tell people like, hey, if if you hand somebody your resume and they're reviewing it, your goal should be to get them to look up from the paper to look in your eyes, because that means you've, you've caught their attention. And I think once you have somebody's attention, then you can start getting into all the technical skills and experience that you have. Um, so I think they go hand in hand, but I, I think it's it's important that, you know, you're going to learn your academics, you're going to build your skills. But then what can't go unnoticed is that building your network and being able to communicate and and have relationships with people to, to have conversations that can both value you and then value them as well. Absolutely. Um, I will say kind of, again, to echo, right? Um, based on what I understand and everything you explained earlier, that people portion in terms of being able to communicate, have conversations, as well as kind of, um, uh, what is it, define like the value in terms of like the work that you do or whatever it is that you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. So I... The way that I kind of find that connection, especially in an analyst role, is that if you're presenting something to like, you know, your clients or people that you work with, you need to be able to communicate that value as to what people are seeing, right? If you visualize something, what does that mean for us? Yeah. Um, how is it that we can apply this new information? And so, yes, there is that portion of like uh, being able to do the technical work because that's super important, but then also being able to communicate that what, what it all means and how it applies to the company in the big picture. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. I think that is a very big thing because again, <laughs> something that happens, you know, I've had the opportunity to speak to different folks from different industries, um, you know, during career fairs and everything. And the number one thing that I think that recruiters mention is that I would have loved if the students just came to me with a bit more confidence, you know, mm -hmm. if they knew if, cause they, I know after looking at their resume, they know what they're talking about, but for some reason they don't sell that to me and I can't get I can't glean that from them. They don't seem confident in their skill. Um, but a lot of these students are doing, you know, really great work and they are fully capable. It's just a matter of kind of like practicing. Yeah. They tend to put like a lot of, you know, these industry professionals a little bit on a pedestal. And I try to have that conversation with them of, you know, you are all just people, um, with people that do hard, hard work, great work. Um, but yeah, number one thing is just that people portion. So thank you for touching on that. Yeah, and a good plug for that too is, you know, and I always speak on this as much as I can when I'm on campus is get involved in a student organization or something, because those student organizations give you the opportunity to, to speak not only with professionals, but other members that you do, you get to coordinate events for certain people. So it, it shows leadership. But again, right, it's even for us, right? Our communication skills is not where it's at today because we just were born with it. There was a time 10 years ago where I was probably the most introverted person in the world and I hated talking, but you just realize that you have to get through things, right? You take certain jobs where you're forced to talk to people. You take classes in school, like public speaking. Um, but those are so key when you get out of school, because regardless of where you go, you're going to have to talk to people. You're going to have to communicate. Um, so it's better to get the mistakes and learning out of the way early so that once you get into the the real world of the career fair, wherever it is that you're you're ready to go, so 100. percent I just think it's it's things you have to work at, things you got to practice on. I couldn't agree more. Um, I am so curious, and I hope you don't mind. I want to kind of put, it's a part of what I do in my everyday. Something that I do a lot is mock interviews with mm -hmm. students, mm -hmm. and uh, a common question that I ask them has to pertains around like. A, have you ever heard of the STAR method of interviewing? Yep. Right, okay. 
Of course, fully aware of it. Mm -hmm. Situation, task, action, result. Great. Mm -hmm. um, I had kind of an interview question for you almost. Mm -hmm. um, and I would really appreciate if you could kind of like implement that method so that students could see, one, how that method is used. Okay. And two, also get a little bit of insight into the work that you do. Okay. So the question goes as, as follows. You're put me on the spot. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, tell me about a time in which you worked on a project of which the result you were particularly proud of. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So I could pick one just recently that I did at work. So within my role that I do in, in finance, I support our upstream business, which is technically, if you think about everything that happens in the process of geologists going and finding rock formations and trying to figure out where we drill and then actual engineers drilling down and trying to bring the product to the surface. So everything that happens in our business up until that point is what we consider upstream. And so we have this annual process where we update our DDNA rates, which is for those who don't understand what DDNA is, it's um, depreciation, depletion, and amortization. And it's basically just shows that, hey, as you're doing your business, you need to have this expense for things once you have the end of life cycle, you're gonna to pay to kind of depreciate your assets over that basis. So we have this annual task where the person, me in this scenario is responsible for coordinating the review that goes on globally um, for this process. And so what I was responsible for doing is reaching out to each of our business units, which I think we have maybe 15 or 20 of them and I'm responsible for providing them with the forms and the spreadsheets that they need to give them all the information that they need to do their analysis. And then once they do that, they will all send it back to me. I kind of QC or quality check the data and then kind of consolidate it into one big summarized portion to say, hey, here are the big changes that are going on throughout the year. And then it's my responsibility to kind of put those into a presentation in which I'm responsible for giving to our vice president of finance. And then I kind of cover those and say, hey, here are the impacts, here are the big things on what's changing and what you need to know about. So again, it goes back to not just communicating the numbers, but telling him, hey, this is what's not in the numbers that you need to be on the lookout for, right? Because he's the one that's going to be making decisions based on the data and he wants to know. And specifically, like for our business, um, DDNA is kind of the biggest driver of what your expense is going to be from your revenues throughout the year and in your operation. And so it's really important to really get that right. So being able to take on that process, which again is something that I had never done before. And I ran into that feeling of, I don't know what I'm doing, being able to work through that, have things come together and then give a successful presentation that was well received, um, not only by finance, but my manager and other people was a really kind of rewarding process. But I got to actually see the value because month over month, whenever we're reporting our results, you get to see those DDNA expenses and how they're moving up and down. And so that was a, a way I got to work on a project that I saw it from the beginning to the end that I was I was really proud of being able to kind of coordinate and, and kind of do on my own. Wow, <laughs> that was that was that was great. I'm so I wasn't sure how I was going to phrase that. <laughs> I was I was nervous for a second when you asked me. I was like, man, now I got to think about something. And that was the first thing that came to mind. So, But I think that really, I think that beautifully captured what I tell students all the time, which is like, you know, the more you do it, the more like practiced, you know, you become, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. A lot of students, and this is why I, I mean, I preach and praise about uh, mock interviews. They're so important yes. so that they just are in that situation more often and they feel yeah. more comfortable with it because, you know, I, I, if I had asked the student that question and they'd given me that answer, I would have been like, okay, you're great. You're good. You, yeah. You're set. You're, you're totally fine. And, um, and that's the thing that you want too is, and, and I myself, I did mock interviews here at the College of Business when I was getting ready to prepare for my interview at Chevron. And it may, even though I may not have needed it, again, it's, it's just good to get feedback from people when you're, so whether I interview with you or I interview with Mr. Hobby or, or Maxine, right? everybody's going to have different feedback that they give you. And so sometimes it's good to just practice and say things because that's right. That's one portion of confidence, right? I'm not having to think about what I'm going to say. I'm not having to make something up. It's because I know in the back of my head what I did. I just have to communicate it to you. 
And so I think that's the biggest thing is when you're more sure of yourself and you've said it a few times, you get more comfortable in, in what you're saying. So yeah, I, I 100% encourage people to participate and to practice and some of those things. And, and what you said was a great point, right? Is like, you could ask one question and if somebody answers it correctly, you go, oh, I'm sold. Like he knows what he's doing. And I can say for sure that's happened to me. And when I've been interviewing people, there may be one or two questions that if they hit it really well, I'm like, oh yeah, this person is, is great. I, there's always that moment where you're like, okay, they're, they're good, right? And you just want to make sure that you have that. But the STAR method, we use that in our interviews. So yes. it, it, it hits home, right, with everybody to understand that. And even as you're answering it, right, I'm, I'm saying in my head, okay, this was the situation. Okay, now I explain the situation. This is what I was tasked with. These are the actions that I took. And this was the results that I had. And if you can tell that, it's almost like painting a picture to somebody. Absolutely. Yeah. If, if they can visualize it and they can see what you're doing, it's like it helps them understand, okay, he's organized. He knows what he's talking about. And I'm sold on it. So it's a great tie-in. I'm so pleased with that. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, students really ought to be aware because I, I don't know if I could tell you the number of times where I've mm-hmm. sat down with a student and I've just, you know, I asked them, of course, the first question, tell me about yourself because mm-hmm. all the time, right? Yeah. And then we move into behavioral questions. And the first, thing I'll, the first thing I'll ask them before we even jump into behavioral questions, do you know the start interview format? Do you know how to answer those questions? Yeah. Um, oftentimes it's no, but that's okay yeah. because we're not born knowing it. We can't know what we don't know. Um, so... I'm happy to hear. Like I just, it just falls so in line with our exact kind of view on it. Um, so I hope that students really take that home and just think, okay, yeah, it is good for me to have a little bit of that introspection, look back at the work that I've done, yeah. and uh, have answers kind of at the ready, or at the very least, know what I've done so that when it comes down to it, I can figure out my answer. Yep. Um, so earlier you mentioned some things. Sometimes things happen halfway across the world that will impact, you know, the industry that you're a part of. Mm-hmm. That's just true. We are here in Texas, which is big in oil and gas. Energy is our thing. We are an energy sector. That's us. Um, question to you. What has, since you've been inside of like, you know, the energy industry, what has been one of the most kind of dramatic, not immediately obvious changes that has impacted I guess more so the company that you've been with or and how that may have even affected your position if at all wow that's a really great one there's a couple things that come to mind but i would say a really good example um to touch on maybe is the the digital acceleration of of society and just how things are moving and it's just because technology is getting smarter and smarter and more developments are made, being made day by day and it's only being moved in one direction, right? It's only accelerating. So I would say even within the past five or six years that I've worked at Chevron, we've seen an acceleration in not only making digital tools and, and platforms a priority, but trying to teach people to kind of reskill them to do things. And so historically, when you think about finance or accounting, you think about people who are and putting transactional work. They're looking at statements. They're putting it into systems. They're the ones validating and making sure everything ties out together. And then they're the ones that are passing the information along. So it was a lot of, I would say, you know, manually intensive jobs that you would have to do, right? Because you're working with thousands upon thousands of rows of data that you're trying to consolidate and, and kind of put into the system. And so, you know, even in a business like Chevron, right, where you're thinking about, you produce a certain product out, out in a in a location, right, in an area. Well, somebody has to monitor that information and then they have to send a paper into an office to say, hey, this is what the meters or different things are reading to say how much we produce. Then somebody has to take that information and they have to put it into a system. They put it into a system that may go to your corporate or headquarters. Somebody has to look at that and then they have to do something with it. And so it's a daisy chain effect. So A lot of that stuff had to be done manually, but now what I've noticed over the past five or six years is that somebody can implement a bot or an automated process to do that same job the whole way through. So instead of a person having to actually be there to do that, right, they can have a a bot run at a certain time of day to pull the information, 
and then they can look at a spreadsheet on paper and say, hey, this is the information it needs to pull out of it. And then you need to do X, Y, Z with it and then send it to this person. And then that can all be done with a push of a button. So a lot of it is, has been having to understand and relearn your skills to not only just do your job, but then also what else can you do like outside of that, right? And it just has to go back to that fixed mindset versus growth mindset. Because if you have a fixed mindset and you're like, hey, I'm only focused on doing this, I don't care about anything else. Well, then, you know, whatever industry you're in, eventually there's going to be some automation or some digital tool that may come and take your job from you. And that's not the reality that people want to hear, but it's, you know, a, a company's biggest expense is their GNA or their salaries that they have to pay to employees. And if there's a way that they can cut that down, right, it's going to increase their profits. And that's not to say people are not needed, but let's say if I have a hundred people and I can implement something and now I only need 30 people, you know, what, what decision is a business going to make, right? And if they could be more profitable and do things easier, but then also it frees up people to work on the more important stuff instead of doing the, the stuff that everybody hates to do, right? If I gave you a, a stack of a thousand papers and I was like, hey, I want you to go through each one of these papers and write your name on it, right? You're doing the same thing on a computer, right? But if I was like, hey, you could do this on an automated process where it will automatically do that for you and it's taken away, you can enjoy that because then now maybe you can do something that frees up your time to do something more important. So I would say those are that's a, a big change that I've seen now is like the, just the digital push, not just from us wanting to learn, but from leaders communicating downward that we need to start in um, implementing things. And it makes it safer, too. So there's also examples in the business where you have um, field engineers or people who need to go out and physically touch assets to make sure there's no leaks, um, there's no you know, gas emissions or different things that are going on. And sometimes those can be very toxic or deadly if you're in the wrong areas. Well, now we have certain technologies where you have people that can put on like hollow lenses or things like that and can fly drones out to different spaces and they can detect if there's a leak or something like that. And instead of having to be there, they can push a button and, and turn the switch off to basically omit everything. And so I, I think things like that are, it's not always um, readily seen, but like those things, they make things safer, they protect people, they're more cost efficient, and it helps you run your business better. So there's, I would say digital is like the most obvious thing that, that I've seen in the past few years that I've been there. Um, I want to touch on something mm -hmm. that you mentioned. Um, well, I mean, I can't help it, but first and foremost, wow. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to say that, yeah, especially when it comes to those more potentially hazardous or, you know, dangerous situations, implementing technology there, so useful, so many lives can be kind of like protected, some cases saved by like having technology do things instead of us. Mm -hmm. I do want to mention the fact that I really appreciate your outlook when it comes to um, this kind of rapid acceleration of like technology, because yes, things are changing. That is just the case. Um, if you kind of stay in your own little in your own little square, right? You're not really willing to grow, have a, have that growth mindset, and learn new skills and everything. There may come a time in which like a robot can do your job, um, and you have to go kind of refocus, right? Um, but I think that mindset is still a good one to have in terms of yes, things are changing, but it's so that we don't have to do things that are like menial or like repetitive. Mm -hmm. There's going to be an opportunity for us to do things that are more important. Um, I, do have I do have a question that is a little bit more dramatic, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but I, based on your mindset, I'm really I'm really looking forward to your answer. So, mm -hmm. do you think that you know a lot of folks that are in that realm of you know analyst roles are in sort of any are in sort of or in any kind of a risk of their positions, right? Due to like this up and coming AI or like you know these new technologies that are like developing. I wouldn't say more so of a, of a risk. Um, I just think the work is going to change, right? And so like inside of Chevron, right, we have technologies that are advancing. And, you know, I may have, when I started, I was in a group that was maybe 150 people. And then there was a digital solution that was implemented that basically changed the size of that group to 150 down to maybe 50 people, right? 
And that's not to say those hundred people got let, let go. It was just, we had to find other places to move them in to do different work because again, it's a journey, right? You can implement that solution here, but if you have a hundred different organizations, um, maybe that can be applied in certain places, but maybe not everywhere. So I wouldn't say that the work kind of went away, um, but I would say it's important to to reskill yourself and, and be aware kind of of what's going on. But at the same time, you have to be cognizant that as things change, your job could change as well. And being at risk of, of losing your job, I don't think people should ever feel like they can't get a finance or accounting degree because they're worried they're not going to have a job or even a job at, in certain industries that you feel like might go away. But what I would say is that I think the outlook, at least like in the near term future, I think that job demand growth for accounting and finance is going to continue to increase and that's just it goes along with regardless of what ai or digital solutions you input to do some of those things like some work will be cut down but there's other things that machines just can't do as of right now and that's like you know when you think about um auditing or tax right you have the tax code which is constantly changing so you need people to interpret those and be able to, and they're not always like straightforward, right? Sometimes they're flexible and, and you have different strategies that you can implement. So it takes people to do those. I would say the same thing with, with the regulatory environment, whether that's in finance or accounting, you have policies or regulations that are constantly changing um, depending like on who's in office. And so you need people to be able to understand those and be able to make decisions on how it's going to impact business. So the, the digital portion of it can do the, the technical aspect of things or the data and all that, but then the data, uh, the digital stuff will give you the, the solution or the data you need, but then it's about, hey, how do I take what they're giving me? And then how do I still tell the story or think about the strategy on, on the direction that we want to take our, our business in? Okay. Um, I, you know, I don't often consider that, you know, finance and accounting that there is such a deep human kind of, uh, like uh, interpretation aspect of it, right? Um, usually when we think of like, you know, AI, computers, whatever, well, we can just program them to do whatever it is that we need them to do. But you're right, there is a certain level of, you know, with experience mm -hmm. comes, with, with experience comes wisdom a lot of the time. And uh, those computers, regardless of whatever information they may know, that wisdom by the person is not, is not really replicable. Right. And another good point to throw in that I was just having this conversation with somebody the other day is that even though you have a system that can technically do what you want it to do, if you think about the majority of financial frauds or accounting frauds that have taken place, it's been about people manipulating financial results. And so it's always it takes a human element of somebody to question that. And, and even if you look at digital solutions, who's creating the digital solutions or AI things that are being implemented? they're being created by people, right? And sometimes people have subjective ways of thinking. And so if I have a certain perspective that I say, hey, I want you to do this, the solution or the, the bot that I'm, or AI thing I'm implementing is gonna do what I tell it to do. So if I tell it to overlook something, whether that's illegal or illegal, the bot will technically do that. And if I don't have somebody in place to look at that, you won't catch it. So I think there's always going to need to be that element of people questioning things or looking at it to make sure that it makes sense. Um, but it's just, you know, people don't realize sometimes that those things that are being created, the algorithms or different things are being made by people who have certain subjective influence over those things as well. Yeah, I think that that uh, perspective is very important. Uh, it kind of ties into what you were saying earlier, that thinking critically portion, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it's not just kind of accepting things at the face value and a part of what makes the a part of that job security is being able to think critically and look at something and ask those whys of like, you know, that five level of why. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, I feel so you've given us lots of really good nuggets, you know, lots of good, great information. So I thank you for that, Justin. It's been a pleasure just being able to talk to you, get a little bit more information about, you know, not just Chevron, but the financial analyst role, what it is to be you know, finance versus accounting, um, information about soft skills, technical skills, and like just, just so much value has been brought into this room. Thank you so much, Justin. I really appreciate it. Um, and just thank you for being a guest on the show. Absolutely. Um, thank you for having me.
<laughs> it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, that's going to wrap it up for today's uh, episode of From Campus to Corporate. Thank you again, Justin, for being here. I hope you have a good one. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.